So I'm Stephen Heidel. I'm the lead software engineer at the AWS Center for Quantum Computing. And today I'll be talking about this paper, Open Chasm 3, a broader and deeper quantum assembly language. So I wanted to start out with a code sample, giving this as a programming languages conference. People may be familiar with Open Chasm 2. Uh, and so here's a code sample from the paper about implementing an iterative phase estimation algorithm. Um, so if you're familiar with Open Chasm 2, you'll notice a few familiar things uh, about this code sample. The first is that the uh, syntax from Open Chasm 2 for running gates and doing measurements is unchanged. So programs that uh, are currently written in Open Chasm 2 will continue to work with Open Chasm 3. But then you'll notice some new things. Uh, we've added classical features to Open Chasm 3, such as the ability to define variables, uh, loops, uh, and other operations on those variables. Um, and so uh, in that way, the language is now broader, supporting more things. But, oh. but it's also deeper uh, in that we've taken existing features such as the ability to or specify quantum gates and uh, extended them in ways uh, shown here, like being able to um, turn gates into control gates, um, invert those gates and so forth using gate modifiers. So that's a bit of a uh, preview on what you're gonna see in the rest of this presentation, which will start with the history a uh, brief history of Open Chasm. Talk about why we're real, why we want a new version, and then finally we'll go through uh, and tour some of the new features, uh, which are of course specified in more detail in the paper. So Open Chasm began really when uh, people were looking for when uh, uh, Mike and Ike were looking for uh, a way to easily. Uh, put together latex images uh, to represent quantum algorithms. So really, they came up with this uh, simple sort of language where you could specify qubits, you could specify gates, and the result was just a picture uh, that showed the quantum algorithm because uh, at that time, um, that uh, there weren't certainly as many ways to run these things as there are today. Um, but a few years later, um, Andrew Cross, who's now at IBM, released Chasm Tools, which took those uh, text files uh, and would run them, returning the waveforms or returning sample data. Um, and so, you know, Chasm went from this just uh, language to make images to something that is now uh, executable and you could actually run it like a programming language. So, fast forward a decade later, and IBM releases uh, a way to run programs, quantum programs over the cloud, uh, including on real quantum hardware. And in order to do this, they need a way of specifying um, quantum programs and listing the, the gates that you want to run. So they released OpenCASM 2, um, which at that time would allowed you to essentially run straight line quantum programs with gates, measurements, uh, and so forth with very little classical, uh, essentially no classical feedback or um, if statements. So this is what it looked like. Um, Open Chasm 2, you would specify the qubits, the classical bits, and then all the gates that you wanted to run in the order that you wanted to run, plus a little bit of information on how uh, those gates should be aligned. But the, the great part about uh, you know, Open Chasm 2 at this point was that you could send it to IBM uh, they would be able to run it against their machines and um, uh, go from there. So then, you know, a month ago, we released this this paper, um, which if you are paying attention, the the author, uh, the lead author here is the same as the one who released Chasm Tools 16 years ago. Uh, but it's all in this same uh, goal of being able to specify quantum programs using just text files and allow them to be run against simulators, uh, quantum machines, and so forth. So 
why do we need a new version, OpenCASM 3, when we already had OpenCASM 2 uh, from a few years ago? There are three trends uh, in quantum programming, which we've seen, and uh, these trends kind of guided our philosophy or implementation of what we decided to put in OpenCASM 3 um, and why OpenCASM 2 was, was falling short. So the first is that we've seen an increase in um, kind of people interested in running classical co-processing uh, or, uh, for instance, repeat Intellix success algorithms or simple feedback. Um, and uh, therefore, we needed to add uh, not just straight line gates and measurements to OpenCASM, but uh, classical features that you saw earlier, like variables, if statements, for loops, and so forth. We've also seen more interest in um, users wanting to move below the gate level and into the pulse level uh, so that you can uh, not only run high level gates, but also control the pulses, the microwave pulses uh, that are run against the, uh, the qubits. Um, either for you know running pulse shaping experiments, running lower level calibration experiments, or uh, attaching those uh, calibrations to to gates and seeing how uh, you can do better than sort of the initial calibrations that were provided uh, by someone like the IBM Quantum Experience. And then finally, we want to support error correction protocols. So this means taking measurements results and doing something with them, uh, whether taking parity um, measurements, uh, running uh, sort of uh, voting uh, against several bits and so forth to uh, be able to start to implement some of the, or at least specify these error correction algorithms um, using OpenCASM 3. OpenCASM 3, really fits into this real-time classical domain. So we specify, you through OpenCASM 3, you can specify programs that run, that are intended to run through the lifetime of a qubit. So OpenCASM 2, with really one exception, uh, would only run quantum operations um, and measurements after those operations. Whereas OpenCASM 3 moves beyond that domain into the real-time classical domain, where you're both running quantum instructions, but you're also running classical instructions that will run within the lifetime of the qubit, and therefore you can do things like measurement feedback and so forth. The next um, domain here is near-time classical, which still exists in the OpenCASM world, uh, OpenCASM 3 world, and this is where the uh, optimization step of something like a BQE algorithm would be run, um, and that would take advantage of the full um, uh, classical computing resources that you have available. The key distinction here is between near-time classical and real-time classical. Uh, the key distinction is the uh, difference in computing resources. So real-time classical, you probably have some specialized hardware that runs, uh, that will be able to run your measurement feedback and simple classical instructions, but you don't have access to a full CPU um, at that point because that would uh, take too long. So this is a heavily simplified version of the diagram, which appears in the paper. Um, but you can see here the same components, which talk about uh, OpenCASM really covering everything that isn't part of the uh, near time domain. So on the right, OpenCASM can be used to describe, or OpenCASM 3 can be used to describe not just the quantum operations, but also the um, control flow uh, and so forth that happens uh, on the uh, controllers, the qubit controllers. So with that little bit of history and motivation in mind, um, I wanted to walk through now some of the new features, uh, which are just, again, described in more detail in the paper, but this should give you a, an intro and, and uh, hopefully uh, motivate you to go take a closer look. So. One of the new features, uh, one of the main new features in OpenCASM 3, which I discussed at the beginning, was these classical semantics. So types, operations, control flow. Um, this is the iterative phase estimation for the first slide. Um, and 
but you can also have some of the other control flow that you would expect from a programming language, like if statements, while loops, and so forth. So here's an example, for instance, uh, at the bottom, where we're running a loop and we don't stop until we get 10 uh, one states measured. Um, and that's all tracked using a counter and doing uh, classical, running classical instructions, uh, uh, you know, during the, uh, the operation of the program. Well, I also talked earlier about the extended quantum semantics. So we, uh, the OpenCASM3 introduces gate modifiers like inverse power control and a global phase um, for when uh, keeping track of phase properly when you do a control uh, gate. Uh, now, interestingly, within OpenCASM3, there are very few built-in gates. Uh, in fact, there's only one built-in gate, the U gate. Uh, from which you can define all other gates using a combination of the U gate, G phase, and the control modifier. So um, in terms of built-ins for quantum operations, uh, OpenCASM3 is relatively, or is, is very uh, streamlined. And uh, most of the standard gates that you'd expect uh, to be able to use out of the box, such as you know, CX, H, and so forth, are defined from uh, the U gate and included in this uh, standard header file. So another thing uh, or another feature that uh, we thought about when 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 uh, designing OpenCASM three was to be able to support the near time classical um, uh, communication with a near time classical domain. So compiling your program once and being able to run it many times with a classical or like a CPU optimization step. Uh, in between. So here we have an example of uh, telling OpenCASM3 what variables are inputs, what variables are outputs, and that will signal to the compiler to leave those things empty and uh, compile them down to, to binaries where they can be uh, uh, inserted later. We also want to be able to support the custom code, uh, custom functions that uh, are being manually um, programmed into qubit controllers. So you can link to those external functions using the extern um, uh, keyword. Here we're talking about uh, and maybe an FPGA or something that has a, a parity operation already um, on it and you want to link to it. Um, uh, so that's sort of the, the fourth line there. Um, but right below it, I, I include an example of how within OpenCASM 3 itself, there's a sufficient number of classical operations that you would be able to implement something like that fully within the language itself. Uh, another thing, uh, another feature that we uh, that gets a lot of care in OpenCASM 3 is timing. So we want to not be uh, not only be able to support um, the uh, ordering uh, of gates, but also being able to uh, specify the delays and how gates align with other gates. So here we're able to, for instance, run a U gate that happens exactly one third of the way through a much longer CX gate. Um, and for the paper, you know, I'd encourage you to take a look at some of these examples, but you can essentially define any sort of um, ordering and alignment of, of different gates between each other and uh, have OpenCASM uh, 3 compiler uh, so, like uh, determine the uh, alignment of these things. And then the final uh, feature that I wanted to show off here was to um, implement the lower level control that we that motivated earlier. So there are now not only the ability to put in quantum operations, but also um, you can run pulses, shift the phase of the pulses, um, uh, run various different types of uh, pulse shapes, um, and keep track of uh, rotating qubit frames in order to implement the lower level pulse control um, that to describe calibration experiments and describe gates. So the uh, there's an example of how through OpenCASM3 you can specify the how gates on different qubits map to different pulse shapes at frequencies, phases, um, and links uh, that is entirely up to the, the author of the OpenCASM3 program. Um, so I hope not 
I hope that this wasn't, uh, I wanted this not to be comprehensive and rather just a uh, teaser to uh, interest you in, in taking a look at more details in the paper. There's a link. There's also, if you search Open Chasm 3 uh, on Google, you can find a link to the live specification, which includes more details in the paper on, um, uh, you know, line by line, what operations are supported and what the syntax looks like. Um, so I'd encourage you to take a look at that if you're interested. And uh, at this time, I think the time is up and I'd love to take questions.